All right, so unfortunately, we only have one microphone. So this is going to be a fun game of pass the potato. This is so, a gentleman that yeah. was promised first. Okay, time okay. Well, Sin, I think this is going to be for you because I don't think there's anybody else that can answer this question. But, uh, okay, so the question is about the mountain of God in the north. And two-part question. One is, what is the future of that arena in that area or that providence? Is you know, because you've read a lot of the ancient books. And then, what do you think is the current activity in that area? Well, I definitely think that Rob also has an uh, opinion on this, but specifically, um, this question is addressed in the third book of the Flat Earth Biblical Cosmology Trilogy that I wrote, Paradise, Sides of the North, and the Mount of the Congregation. And I do believe that that area, uh, whereas there's a lot of interest on the Antarctica region and the outer rim or the outer circle of what is the plane of the earth, um, according to the mythology, there's a lot of hidden and supernatural aspects to the north and what even um, what is translated as Lucifer in Isaiah 14 when he says he wants to exalt his throne above the stars and the clouds of God above the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north this area the north pole is what he is specifying because when you take all of the um, as far as the outer rim of the circle of the earth and you come to the north they all join in union above what is the mount of the congregation and even the word for the north saphalon in the hebrew indicates a hidden place a mystical a something that has been preserved um, and so without a doubt according to what I've looked at and examined and have brought forth in biblical cosmology that the north is the gateway of what Jacob calls the the ladder and that here is where he saw the angels uh, of God and also of the devil ascending and descending and going into the sides of the north, the mount of the congregation, the place where the council of the mighty meets with the father, and also that there is a hollow earth entrance there into the interior of the earth, and that this is where Satan was cast down to, the sides of the pit, and that Sheol is his region. That's where the domain of legion, and that we are told, even in the uh, Brenton translation of the Septuagint in Isaiah chapter 13. It specifies at the end of the days that when the wrath of God is poured out on the wicked, those not written into the books of life, that a supernatural army, the locust army, the Joel 2 uh, army that comes forth to devastate and that leaves a destruction of wilderness behind them, that this will come forth from the north. And Jeremiah, there's a prophecy contained therein, as well as to this being um, part of that judgment of the day, the great and terrible day of the Lord. So I do believe that if people want to know more about the structure of the cosmology and how the north is this particular gateway, this portal, we see even in the chapter 18 of the book of Enoch, he speaks about going up into uh, and being brought before the Most High God, and that this is the portal that he was led through. Chapter 18, yes. Chapter 14 through 18 in the Book of Enoch speak about his translation and being brought before the Most High God. And so I think that the, the North will be a place of where the supernatural armies that are being withheld, that even the giants speaks about in the Cave of Treasures and the Book of the Bee. And there's a chapter in that book, Paradise Sides of the North, uh, on the hollow earth, that reveals and connects 
these particular events to that later day unfolding. And I do believe it is also part of the Most High God removing his restraining hand uh, and that the elites in all of their efforts to conjure up the devils and the demons and to bring forth those kind of supernatural forces into this world to destroy us, that it will backfire on them and that the judgment will actually be upon them at that time. So, Rob, do you want to add anything? Uh, Zen and I got into what we now call biblical cosmology probably about the same time, I think. Uh, in fact, I think you were the only other researcher that that I saw doing that in the same realm that, you know, of the Nephilim and all that kind of stuff. And so it was through his work that I got turned on to the letter that uh, Gerardus Mercator wrote to uh, John D, right? It was John D. Uh, that blew my mind. John D. The, uh, he was a mathematician, alchemist kind of guy reported to, was it Queen Elizabeth or somebody? Uh, you know, most of us growing up in school, public school, we had the Mercator map on the wall, right? Well, that, that map doesn't show everything. The original Mercator map had a little bump out that showed the region of the north with four land masses you know, separated by rivers with this Mount Meru thing in the middle. And that was in all the Mercator maps. And I'm like, something's missing here. What's going on? You know, I started looking, the more I started looking into that, the more fascinated I became with the north. I mean, when you get into flat earth or biblical cosmology, we tend to focus on Antarctica because what do we do with Antarctica, right? Well, it becomes, it goes from being a continent to being this rim. And so you were fascinated, well, can we touch the wall? You know, where's the dome connect to the earth? And we start thinking along those lines. But the more I started looking into the north, the more intrigued I became and actually think there's more interesting things to be looked at in the north than in the south um, for all the reasons he just said. I mean, there's a, a whirlpool. It's something like 430 miles or something like that across a huge whirlpool that, that surrounds this chasm that Mount Meru comes up out of it. And when you look into Admiral Byrd, many people uh, have studied hollow earth and stuff like that, have looked into Byrd and how he supposedly flew into this entrance in the north. I mean, people who are into hollow earth and ancient aliens, all that stuff, they love Byrd for all that. But there's so much more to it. And I went to the uh, Contact in the Desert conference uh, last year in California, and that was the whole ancient aliens crowd, Eric Von Daniken, Giorgio with the big hair, all those guys, they were all there, and um, oh, I can't think of his name, uh, he, he's always got a commercial on TFR, uh, Bro Brooks Ad Agnew, I went to his presentation, and he was talking about actually chartering a, a, a boat, uh, a whole ship to go up there, I, I don't know whatever happened with that, but his whole presentation was about figuring out what, what's going on in the north, and so, I don't know, but I think, you know, Zen nailed it a minute ago. There's definitely prophetic significance to it. And when it comes to cosmology, I mean, that's, that's the center right there, right below the throne of, yeah. of God. So, uh, pretty extraordinary anyway. That's my take on it. I just have a, need a clarification. And the revelation, it says that the entire world will be deceived. Um, I just don't see my my understanding is not correct, but th that's what the revelation says that the entire world will be deceived. Does that mean that everybody sitting in here is going to be deceived by the Antichrist, or am I way off? Or well, I I have a take on that, and and I'm actually going to be talking about that tonight, as a matter of fact, <laughs> and 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 tomorrow uh, as well. So I'll just pass it on. No, uh, come back later. Uh, you know, when we think about the coming great deception, the strong delusion, I, I don't think it's an either or. Uh, I think it's a, a both and kind of thing. Like, because a lot of people say, well, the great deception is this. Well, no, maybe it's this, or maybe it's, I, I think it's all of it. I think there's, the, it's called a great deception. It's huge. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's so many things that are involved, in my opinion. Um, but when I think of cosmology, I mean, the whole world believes we're on a spinning ball. I mean, that's about the only thing everybody agrees on, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, look at all the other things that we might consider the great deception, and most of that within Christian circles, you know, we'll have different ideas of what that might be. Uh, is it the Sabbath or is it the this or whatever? Um, 
but regardless of race, color, creed, religion, it doesn't matter. Everybody believes they're on a spinning ball. So to me, that's the biggest part of the great deception. And what concerns me about that is even in Christian circles and some of the conferences and stuff that I used to be a part of before I got blacklisted, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that that they're still all about the, you know, they'll take the ancient alien narrative and they'll deny that aliens exist. And they believe, as I did, that aliens, what we call aliens, are really just fallen angel activity, demonic activity, and things of that nature. But they still believe in the ever-expanding cosmos, and they leave open the idea of what's known as the plurality of worlds. You know, if there's, and I've said it myself when I was in that paradigm, looking up at the sky and looking at all those stars up there, thinking that all those stars have planets going around them, surely we can't be the only ones out here. And even when the Catholic Church first started to embrace that idea, that you had some of these people, high-ranking people, even popes even, within the Catholic Church, putting forth doctrine dealing with the plurality of worlds. Because if we believe there's a creator, and we believe in an ever-expanding universe with plurality of worlds, then did Jesus have to die for those planets too? And then the bigger question becomes, well, what if they didn't sin? And if they didn't sin, then what does that mean? You know, and you had people, you know, even fairly recently uh, within the Catholic Church, high ranking officials saying, hey, listen, you know, if aliens show up, we'll baptize them. Dot, 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 if they need it. Yeah, yeah, right. And the implication there was maybe we have something more to learn from them. And because if they didn't, if they came from a world that didn't fall, that didn't need redemption, that didn't need, you know, the sacrifice of Jesus and everything, then maybe we have something to learn from them. I mean, that opens up a Pandora's box of massive problems, theological problems, uh, among other things. So, uh, well, some of these people will entertain this idea. I mean, I, and if you saw the debate, how many of you saw the debate I had with uh, Dr. Robert Sengenis? Anybody see that debate? Uh, yeah, I actually love Dr. Sengenis. I think he's a really great guy. Obviously, we have disagreements. And I'm like, dude, you're like this close, man. He's already geocentric. You know, it's like if you acknowledge that geocentricity is true and that heliocentricity is false, you gotta throw out everything you think you believe anyway. Right. You know, be like a half an inch from the finish line, bro. <laughs> you know? uh, well, I appreciate that. His supporters would say the other way around, but but uh, what you guys don't know is that uh, bless his heart, as we say in Texas, bless his heart. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> I won't tell you what that means, but uh, he, uh, <laughs> bless his heart. He was trying to convert me to Catholic. He's like Captain Catholic, so he was trying to. Uh, convert me to Catholicism through lengthy email debates that we were having back and forth with each other. I'm like, dude, save it, man. You're not, you're not going to convert me to Catholicism. Uh, but I mean, it's interesting because in his paradigm, the church is, is supreme over, even over Sola Scriptura. In fact, I've watched probably 30 something hours of Dr. Sengenis debating other people on lots of different stuff to prepare myself to debate the guy. And you know, he goes into these debates, you know, for me, it's solo scriptura. I believe that scripture, you know, trumps everything. Uh, but he believes the church trumps scripture. So when you start getting into so-called church fathers and popes and different people making different decrees, and their, their thinking evolves over time, it's like, well, you know, what if they, the church decrees there are aliens and they are our creators? You know, I mean, this opens up huge problems. So long answer to say that I think cosmology starts it all off. I mean, that's, that's from the title for my lecture tonight is why is it important? Why should we care about this thing? Well, that sets the stage for everything else because this is, it's going to determine the playing field in which the rest of the Bible takes place. So I'm of the opinion, especially with the in massive increase of so-called disclosure aliens, uh, UFO activity and things like that happening, that I'm of the, of the opinion that something's probably right around the corner. And that's why I believe that biblical cosmology came out when it did to make us aware of some of these things. Uh, I do agree that the strong delusion encompasses so much more than what we may be attributing it to when trying to generalize it to one specific thing. Uh, and that it does say that you know, there would be a time where even the very elect could be deceived should it be possible. And that this would occur because there is no love of the truth in the world. And we see that Paul also says that there would be this great falling away, the time of iniquity and wickedness. And 
certainly we are present to all of those things occurring uh, in the world right now. Uh, but with regard to strong delusion, I do also believe that biblical cosmology has a great part to play in that it was specific to coming out in that particular time because it connects to not only to the ever-expanding universe and the premise that all the stars in the sky are suns, they all have planetary systems revolving in orbit around them, and that they all could have randomly uh, evolved the miracle of life in some crazy way. Um, that is all based upon the heliocentric Copernican model for understanding world. And so when you realize that the stars are not suns, the sun is specifically something unique, the great light, the great luminary, as spoken about in the book of Enoch, and that the luminaries are made of water and light and do not have terraform or structure like that of the earth, and that the earth is not like all of the other stars and worlds that they suppose to exist out there, we realize without question that these extraterrestrials, that they are demons and they are legion and they are connected to the fallen angels which fell so long ago and which have been waging war against humanity since that time. In the chapter 29 and 30 of the book of The Secrets of Enoch, it, it specifies this event as happening on the second day. And so when you examine that and really consider it, you look at the world in the ancient past, all of these megalithic cyclopean structures that we see worldwide that are said to be you know, indication that the extraterrestrials came here long ago, that they seeded humanity, and that they left and that are coming to save us from ourselves. Um, this is part of the strong delusion and the great lie that biblical cosmology absolutely destroys and nullifies. And so when it comes to scientism, the educational system and our indoctrination of our children worldwide, there, in my opinion, is no greater threat to separating uh, people from the mindset and understanding of intelligent design. And also that the earth was made a special place for our inhabitation. And so those things are very important, again, to this particular revelation that has just come out since 2015. Some were on board even before then. Um, but it is also connected to the times and the seasons being changed. The calendar, the Sabbath, um, which Diane, my good friend Diane, wrote a book, Yahweh's Unique Timepiece Explained, and also other books that follow up on why understanding the Levitical feast days is important, and how it was that Christ in first and second coming fulfilled those particular dates, and will also fulfill in second coming the remaining fall feast. And so very important to understand the holy days, the calendar, the true calendar, how, in my opinion, it is linked to even the phases of the moon, that the moon has a particular reason why it cycles in seven, and that the Sabbath, you know, being linked and indicated by these, uh, these particular phases, I believe that, you know, again, the Levitical feast days and even the Sabbath, those things have been changed and are part of the strong delusion. And so um, the coming of the Antichrist and the declaration that the extraterrestrials are our creators, I believe this is the end game. And we're seeing this pushed even now. The ancient aliens, the History Channel, the premise that they are our creators and they're coming to save us from ourselves. This is now, you know, the number one program in the world. And I did my presentation on Take on the World according to this specific theme. And I mentioned in there a sci-fi miniseries called Childhood's End. Oh, yeah. And it shows in this series how the overlords, as they call them, 
coming to resolve all the issues of humanity, war, famine, pestilences, starvation, uh, diseases, all these things, they remain in the background for a certain period of time. And then revealing themselves are exactly the hoof horned Satan of you know, Christian uh, de definition. And so we see that even in that show, this same premise is being indicated in that particular narrative. And so um, understanding like we do, and those of you that have looked into and understand biblical cosmology and that we live in an enclosed world, that these devils, these demons, they're not from somewhere out there and they're not returning. They've been here with us all along. And the deception has been geared and engineered so that everybody would accept the Copernican heliocentric model and be deceived by that foundation. Because look at it again, you know, the, all the children and most of the people of the world believing that we live on a spinning ball, they also think that we evolved of apes and that life just randomly, you know, that DNA just randomly came about, which is impossibility. And so, yeah, I do believe that the strong delusion encompasses a lot of things, but that the coming reign of the Antichrist will without a doubt be linked to the declaration that the extraterrestrials, these alien gods, these ancient aliens are our creators. Thank you. Uh, question, two questions, one for each of you guys. Is there a hidden trap or agenda in the pre-tribulation rapture belief that can make Christianity fall away? Well, that's the first one. And in relation to that one, is the church physically, physically protected somehow from the dangers during the tribulation? And is it uh, a good idea to be a prepper? <laughs> Yes, yes, and yes, thank you. Uh, wow. Um, maybe I'll work my way backwards. Is it a good idea to be a prepper? I think so. Um, I think it's just a good idea in general. Put rapture discussions aside, just right. in general. I mean, you saw what happened with toilet paper just recently, right? Yeah, right. I, I mean, I think it's, it's wise. Um, when it comes to end times, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm in, I'm in Maccabees mode, if you don't know what that means read the Maccabees. <laughs> uh, I'm of that mindset myself, personally. Uh, and the reason I am is because I no longer believe in the preacher of rapture. <laughs> uh, I actually believe I'm going to be here through all this stuff. And I'm saying that as somebody who was a hardcore preacher of rapture guy, like hardcore, wrote about it, taught about it, drew charts about it, like I was Captain Preacher of Rapture guy uh, until just a few years ago. Um, and I just had some discussions at my table about this, uh, you know, because, you know, most of us, especially if you grew up in evangelical Christianity, you've kind of been raised around it, uh, especially in, in the Baptist faith where I, I grew up in, uh, very much was preacher of rapture. But scripture just doesn't support it. It just simply doesn't. And I could explain that easily to you if you want to have a longer conversation about this than this Q&A uh, deal. But I, I believe that the church is being set up on that. Um, and it's interesting that even the New Agers and the Ancient Aliens crowd, they actually believe something like that's coming as well. Um, there's an ascension idea. Um, even in Childhood's End, it was the whole idea of the kids being raptured up. Uh, and there's lot, we've been pre-programmed for all of that, uh, the idea that something is going to take us out of here. Uh, and, you know, when I look at Scripture, I don't see precedence for anybody escaping tribulation for, for, with a rapture. I, you had the other question was, are we going to be protected during it? I believe that people who are wise will be. I believe that there's a wise virgin, foolish virgin paradigm. And that the wise, the wise go in, in, not up, to a place of safety. And when I began to come off of the preacher rapture page myself, I started stressing because I was really freaking out, right? Like, well, I'm not prepared for this. Like, I'm thinking I'm not going to have to deal with this, you know, before. Uh, and it was back in, I think, 2012-ish, somewhere around there, which was interesting, too. If you remember, 2012, December 21st, 2012, and all the hype behind that and everything that was going on, you know, at that time. Uh, what's going to happen? Are the Anunnaki going to come back and, you know, all this kind of stuff? 
Um, I went to a Passover conference, and uh, I think it was in Denver, and uh, Pastor Norm Franz was teaching, and he said, in the course of his dialogue and his message, he said, your Goshen is wherever God has you. And wow, that really, like when he said that, it just, it was, that set me free. Because at that time, I think of where we're going to move, you know, like yeah. where we're going to go. You know, I want to get out of here, find some place safe. Uh, there's not going to be any place safe. There might be some places that are safer than others, but ultimately this whole world's in for a rough ride. And uh, so what he meant by that was, if you remember, Joseph was sold into slavery, right? And, you know, the Potiphar's wife and all that stuff. And then he, he became, you know, he was raised up to second in command of all of Egypt and was used in a mighty way to preserve people from the famine that was coming as a prepper, right? And the whole house of Jacob came down, 70 people came down to Egypt at that time, and they ended up in a place called Goshen. And that's where they were preserved and protected. If, you're, if you read the Exodus, I became thoroughly convinced over the last 10 years that Revelation is nothing more than an amped up repeat of Exodus. I mean, I did a parallel, I did a, like an Excel spreadsheet and put the plagues and stuff of Exodus side by side with the plagues and stuff of Revelation. And there's a direct correlation. I mean, it's, it's almost exact. And lots of things. So I'm like, well, okay, if, there's a, if Revelation is an amped up repeat of Exodus, there's no preacher rapture <laughs> going on in, in Exodus. But they were preserved where God had them. They happened to be in the land of Goshen. And yes, they experienced the first three of the ten plagues. The Israelites experienced those. So we're going to experience stuff, in my opinion. Um, but for the more hardcore, difficult, you know, scary stuff, they were preserved in the land of Goshen. And I don't know about you, but like if I was an Egyptian and I was seeing everything that's happening and my pharaoh, my leader is being stubborn. It's like he's like, look, just let these people go. You know, no, he didn't. Here we go. Something else something happening. Right. I'd be like, honey, I don't know what those guys are doing over there, but they're killing a lamb, putting blood on the door. Go get a lamb. <laughs> I, that's that would have been me. Okay? I don't know what they're doing, but it seems to be working out for them. So, I, you know, for me personally, I would have been part of the mixed rabble that joined them, you know, on the way out. And, and I would also, with that same story, say that Christians say, well, in defense of the preacher rapture, they'll say, well, Christians are not appointed unto wrath. That's true. Babylon is. What do you think is going to happen to you if you stay in Babylon? It's conditional. The Israelites were not appointed to lose their firstborn children, right? But what happens if they didn't put the blood on the door? Well, they lost it. And vice versa, if the, if the Egyptians did put the blood on the door, what happened? They were preserved. So I, I see these things as conditional promises. And so for me, it's like, well, what does it mean to come out of Babylon then? If, if Babylon is appointed in the wrath, I'm not appointed in the wrath, but if what does it mean to come out of Babylon? Well, that was my first book, Babylon Rising. And when I wrote the last chapter, I thought it was going to be the last chapter. It's called Coming Out of Babylon. At that time, it was all geopoliticals dealing with our troops leaving Iraq. Um, and I was like, cool, I'm done with the book. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you're not done yet. You've got to come out of Babylon too. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm not in Babylon. I left the army in 93. And, you know, <laughs> he's like, no, no. Uh, and I had already done a lot of research about Nimrod and various uh, traditions, Christmas and Easter and all kinds of things that go directly back to uh, Nimrod. So I, I, I understood what he was saying. You know, I need to come out of Babylon too. Is that there's so many things that what I now refer to as pagan Christianity is directly related to to Nimrod and Babylonian activity. So it began to, our exodus, my wife and I coming out of all that and learning about the Sabbath and the feasts and getting on God's page. He, he's got holidays. You know, he wants us to celebrate holidays. They just don't happen to be X mess and Ishtar day, you know? And so I realized, well, wait a minute. If I trade two, I get eight. That's a good deal. <laughs> trade two pagan beast feasts and I get eight. I get the seven Moedim, the appointed times, plus the Sabbath. That's a good deal. Uh, so... How do we get protected? How do you be a wise virgin in the, in the parable of the ten virgins? Well, it's my opinion that it, Scripture tells you over, it's not my opinion, Scripture does tell you over and over again that to obey God is wise. It is foolish to disobey God. So to the extent that I can follow in his ways, do what he says to do, that I believe that I'm in going, hopefully praying, that I'm in the category of wise, and in that regard, I believe, will be protected. When I look at all the examples of tribulation and trials and stuff in Scripture, no one's flying up into the sky. You know, uh, Enoch, well, they say, well, Enoch's a rapture. Well, he did go up into the sky, you know, but he didn't do so to escape tribulation. In fact, he went through the 500-year clash of the titans. 
He went through 500 years of the Clash of the Titans. Then he was raptured after they were all, you know, judged, bound, and buried and everything. Uh, then you have Noah. And, of course, Enoch's raptured 700 years before the flood. All right. Then Noah, well, he goes through the flood in this thing called an ark, you know. Then you have Lot and his family with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. No, they were escorted out to a little, you know, town of safety. You know, you have the Israelites in Goshen preserved during the judgment. You have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as their, their substitute names. I always forget their Hebrew names. Um, but they were stuck in the, in the fiery furnace and had deliverance in the fire. Daniel delivered from the lions where? In the lion's den. So every example that I can show you in Scripture is showing preservation in the midst of it, not escape from it. In and through. Absolutely. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Paul tells us, he says, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Question, when does the dead in Christ, when do they rise first? First of all, how many first resurrections are there? Anybody? <laughs> One. One first resurrection. I'm going to help you out. Uh, when is the first resurrection? Read John, uh, Revelation chapter 20. John tells you it's after the tribulation. Well, Paul tells you the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them, the ones who are dead in Christ that rise first, to be caught up together to meet him in the clouds. When is Jesus going to be in the clouds? He tells you in Matthew 24, 29 through 31, immediately after the tribulation of those days, you will see the Son of Man come in the clouds and with the sound of the trumpet and the archangel, and he's going to gather his elect. I'm like, you know, how did I miss all these scriptures for 46 years of my life, right? Because I didn't want to see them. You know, ultimately, long answers, but I hope that answers your questions. <laughs> well, I, I will tell you, South Dakota does look awfully attractive these days. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily our Goshen. Uh, yeah, no, I got you. Yeah. 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 When? Yeah. I. First of all, when when I. When I hear the word Babylon, I think of two things, a physical location and a system. Uh, I believe, biblically speaking, the physical location is the physical location that was in existence at the time of the Bible. I know there are people who disagree with me. This is just my opinion. Uh, you know, some people like 9-11, see Babylon, New York, the merchants wailing, you know, New York is Babylon. I, I don't believe that. Uh, I believe the Babylon of the Bible is the physical Babylon in the land that we now call Iraq. Um, but I believe there's a Babylonian system, which was what I was referring to earlier, which the whole world is wrapped up in, frankly. The whole world is wrapped up in the Babylonian system. So I think wherever you are geographically, you can come out of the Babylonian system. As far as what's going on in Portland and New York and everything else, I mean, I think some of these people are just waking up like, it's crazy here, I'm getting out of here. Uh, it's probably wise, but I don't think that any of those places are Babylon, you know, in my opinion. I also agree that Babylon is a system and that it has to do with the powers, the principalities, the rulers of darkness, wickedness in high places, and the 
agent provocateurs, as it says in the protocols, those that take blood oaths and dedicate themselves to the agenda of the New World Order, and that we see and that Yahushua calls them the synagogue of Satan. And I do believe without a doubt that they are connected to the children of the devil, the progeny that has been waging war against the sons of Adam and that were the assassins of the prophets from Abel to Zacharias. And that this has implications even to what Daniel revealed as the beast kingdom. And so the system is worldwide and it has to do with the one world order, the economic system, the religious system, political system, all that that is being put into place and which will push forth the, um, the tyranny of even those things that are written about in 1984 and the brave new world. And I think that this particular system uh, militarily is the United States, uh, that we are an extension of that, that religiously the Vatican and uh, the, the whole Catholic religion that as a, um, you know, come out of her, my, Babel, um, my people, that that is also part of that. And as well that uh, financially London is, seems to be indicative of these particular loose-knit factions that are, again, part of the New World Order. And so um, I think that's what we are to recognize, especially at the end, end of days, to not be involved in and certainly to not bend the knee to if there is this alien god, this uh, Antichrist that comes forth and declares himself to be Messiah and the Savior of the world and you know, then coming forth and given power and authority through the United Nations, we are all to recognize those kind of things. Um, and so with regard to the rapture, uh, I also believe that Scripture tells us after the tribulation of those days, and that even though we are not appointed unto wrath, certainly there are aspects of uh, trial and testing and gold being refined that will you know, be part of what we all go through and that we'll see as comes forth again with relation to the Antichrist taking power and assuming authority and then bringing forth uh, what will be. It tells us that he's going to make war against the saints. And so, you know, and there are those that wash their uh, robes white in, in the blood of those particular um, assassinations and attempts. And, and so while I pray, you know, that the pre-tribbers are right, um, I think that it's clear in Scripture that uh, we are to take precautions. And that being doomsday preppers or those that put forth uh, emergency supplies, water, you know, food, um, even batteries, medical supplies, whatever. Even uh, guns, ammo, the, all these things are, are disappearing. Um, and that, you know, even the, if you looked at lately how all the supplies, the dehydrated food, all of that has uh, been wiped out. You know, people are really taking notice. And so it is an indication as well uh, that there's an awakening happening that most of the world is not aware of and is certainly not being declared on mainstream news. We have about 15 minutes left. We want to get to as many questions as possible. So if we could speed it up, but also we're going <laughs> to... Uh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, but we're also, uh, we also promised some of the live stream people that we might take a couple of questions. So we're going to go a little bit over time, but just trying to make sure... <laughs> okay. Short sorry, Joy. Short answers. Yeah. Hey, Robin Zen. Um, first off, thanks so much for all your hard work. It's such a blessing to all of us. Um, my question, Deuteronomy. <laughs> In Deuteronomy 4, starting around verse 26, uh, Yah says that he calls into witness heaven and earth. Um, in case the Israelites break covenant, break the commandments, then he will disperse them, which we know happen. But I'm wondering, and what your thoughts are on this, do you think that's part of the reason why Hasatan so harshly attacked 
the creation model was to attack that witness of heaven and earth. That's a great question. That is a great question. You know, I hadn't thought of that, but that makes perfect sense <laughs> because, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> uh, uh, let me see if I can repeat it now. Um, when, there are several places in Deuteronomy, actually, where he says that, that he calls heaven and earth to witness against Israel, you know, about these things. If you do this or you don't do that, you know, these things will come upon you. And she asked, is that, is that maybe the reason why Satan launched such an attack against the model of heaven and earth? And I would say absolutely. And, you know, in, in that regard, one of the most frequent comments that I hear from people when they finally embrace biblical cosmology is the realization of the tangible closeness of Yahuwah. Yes. Like, he's like right there. <laughs> Yeah. An atheist realizing that because yeah. <laughs> they're like, well, wait a minute, if we're in a terrarium, then somebody built this place. And he's like right there. Uh, because in the standard cosmological Copernican model, where's God? Right. Where is he? Oh, he's in another dimension. He's everywhere. He's in another dimension. But in this cosmology, he is a localized entity right. who's very close. And so many people have written to me saying how that has meant so much to them. And it's going to mean so much to everybody regardless, one way or another, because there's going to come a time when that sky dome is going to open up. Yeah. Then there's not going to be any questions anymore about biblical cosmology. The sky dome is going to open. Oh, okay. <laughs> there it is. Also, it, understanding that paradise and where the home of the righteous is that they are with God above the vaulted dome of the earth, even right now. And that we are the apple of the eye of the Most High. And that he has been specifically watching over us and leading everything to his own prophetic end. And he's not having to worry about or even consider all of these other worlds and all of these supposed other civilizations and all of these other uh, even peoples and how the Vatican announces that, you know, the extraterrestrials are closer to God than we are and that we have something to learn from them. This is all part of, again, the deception of the strong delusion, in my opinion. Quick story <clears throat> before my quick questions. I checked in and went down the hallway and I saw a desk lamp on the floor and I thought, oh, Rob Lowe's, I mean, Rob Skiba is on my floor. <laughs> So, doing a science experiment. <laughs> We're way past that, right? <laughs> okay, well, help me, because I've, I've thanked you both individually for bringing me into the truth and flattening my world last Christmas. I didn't put up a tree, and now I know why. So, um, I'm coming out of, yeah, coming out of all that. So, what is your take on uh, communion? And then the second question is, what is causing the moon cycles, the shadow on the moon, so to speak? Thank you. Communion and moon cycles, totally different. <laughs> Ping, boom. Wow. Didn't even put a blinker on. <laughs> All right, short answer. Uh, communion, that's something the Catholic Church made up. What we call the Lord's Supper or communion was Passover. He repeatedly says, I long to have this Passover meal with you. So he's having a Passover meal with them, and he says, whenever you do this, what's the this that they were doing? Do this in remembrance of me. What's the this? He was having Passover. You know, now, I will say, I, don't, I personally don't think there's anything wrong with recognizing the bread and the, the wine as his body and blood. Um, I've had some personal experiences myself where he's told me to, quote, unquote, take communion, you know, just in my house by myself. And he was doing something to show me something. But I think that biblically speaking, other than situations like that, it's Passover. Yeah. You know, so that, that's when I do it. Um, it the others, the, I, there's a whole other long explanation about where the Eucharist and all that teaching and all that comes from. So we don't have time for that. As far as the moon phases go, it says that the earth is, uh, I mean, that the moon gives its own light. And interestingly enough, I went to the, um, oh, what is that observatory, famous uh, Griffith Observatory? in Los Angeles. And have you been there? Okay, well, if you've been there, you know, when you first walk in, it's all pagan, you know, pictures of gods and stuff, and then you got this pendulum, you know, pretty famous pendulum there, Foucault, Foucault pendulum. 
Um, but they have all these exhibits that show how things work. And when I got to the exhibit of how the moon phases work, you would think, if, if, if what we're told is true, then you'd have a spinning ball representing the Earth and a spinning ball representing the moon that's also orbiting in such a way that its spin allows the face to only you know, face the Earth. And then you'd have a light source over here that would represent the sun, and that would show you the moon phases. That's what they, would, they should do, right? All their other exhibits show you how things work. And they had models of how they work. But when it came to that model, they had a self-illuminating moon going around, changing its own phases. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> Maybe they put it right there in plain sight. I don't know. Um, with regard to the communion, uh, we put out a video of how we celebrate Passover. And we do uh, take communion on Passover because it is specific to Christ being the Passover lamb. Uh, even John recognized that, behold, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And so in recognizing the blood and that the promise um, of eternity is through him, that he paid the price as the Passover lamb, and that he fulfilled the Levitical feast days, resurrected as the high priest on the day of first fruits, and that taking Adam and his descendants back to their first estate, he was presenting to Yahuwah the Father uh, them as the resurrected first fruits. And then we see that afterwards on Pentecost of Shavuot, that is when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and gave and tasked them with the Great Commission to go forth and teach. Uh, the good news of salvation through him to the rest of the world. And he will fulfill the three remaining fall feasts. And so, yes, communion is specific to Passover. And that's what we recognize it as. Um, the other question with regard to the phases of the moon, there is written in Paradise, Sides of the North and Mount of the Congregation, a passage from the Book of Enoch that mentions a lesser moon. And I do believe that there are bodies, luminaries out there that are like dark objects like Rahu and Ketu that have some aspect to play in the cosmology that we don't yet understand. And that even the phases and the eclipses, those things are a portion to perhaps this kind of interaction. But because all of us are reconsidering everything that we thought we knew with regard to biblical cosmology, there are still mysteries, secrets out there that we don't understand. And that's why I also think that the study of the extra biblical manuscripts is important in order to bring elucidation to these kind of things. And so I do believe, again, the lesser moon has some kind of part to play. And there's also mention of two clouds that interact um, with changing the phases of the moon. It makes you wonder if this is also in some way linked to Rahu and Ketu. But we don't know yet for sure. Yeah, I would also just add, it's interesting to me whenever we start talking about uh, flat earth or biblical cosmology, that the first thing everybody does is they look up. Well, what about the stars? What about the sun? What about the moon? I'm like, the topic is what is the shape of the ground? <laughs> Why is the first thing you do look up in the sky? Like everybody does that. But it's reasonable. We all do those. We all have the same questions. And when I was really struggling with all that myself, the moon was a big issue for me. I was having a really hard time trying to figure out what's doing what and why. And we say it's a reflector, right? Well, I mean, okay, if, if this is the moon right here and the sun is right here shining on the moon, where should the terminator line be, right? It should be right here, right? But so many times I would look up in the sky and I would see the sun over here, see the moon over here, and the shadow would be like completely wonky from what it should be. Like, how is that Terminator line coming from that light source? That didn't make sense. And then one of the blood red lunar eclipses, I think it was in 2017, I think it was October, if I remember right. I was on a, a parking garage roof with my cameras out and everything, and the sun went down behind me and the moon popped up about 20 minutes after the sun went down over here, right directly in front of me. And within about 20 minutes, it started going blood red. Now, if in that model, supposedly, you, know, you have earth here, moon here, sun here, right? And, and that's the, the shadow of the earth is creating, you know, the, the umbra, penumbra and all that is creating the shadow that creates the, the blood red moon, 
right? Okay, well, think this through. If the sun goes down, if my head is the earth, it's supposed to cast a shadow on the moon, and the moon is right over here, and the sun's going down behind me, so here's the sun going down, what direction should the shadow be going, right? Should be going up, right? Sun going down, my head is the earth, the shadow should be going up like this. Well, the shadow came down this way. <laughs> so I'm going, what? <laughs> yeah. And then you start looking into finding out that there are blood red lunar eclipses that have been documented even fairly recently when the sun's still up. So all of a sudden you get like, I, no, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know. But I know what they're telling me is not true. So the pre-tribulation rapture seems to me to be the lie that's hiding the event of the gathering of the elect, to which I'm under the impression of that angels will come down, gather the elect for training to do one last mission upon the earth of spreading the gospel. And it seems to me also that the Space Force and Project Blue Beam are maybe an attack on that. And I just wanted to know this, the gathering of the elect topic doesn't seem to be discussed enough within, um, I'd like to hear more of your thoughts about that. Well, like I said, I don't, I don't believe in the preacher of rapture. So uh, when I look in scripture, I see bad guys being taken away and good guys staying. So we had a famous novel series called Left Behind, right? You, you want to be left behind. Wh who goes first, wheat or the tares? Tares go first, wheat stays. Look, look, this is our place. This is ours. Bad guys go, good guys stay. So in this paradigm of, you know, aliens coming and taking people away, I, when it talks about, I, Paul also said there's going to come a falling away first. And some people, bless their heart, <laughs> want to take the word apostasia and say that means departure as in rapture. Well, it just tell, it, that sentence makes no sense at all because it's talking about that day being the day of rapture. So you might as well say, well, the rapture can't come first until the rapture happens first. That doesn't make any sense. And the word apostasia does not mean being taken up into the sky. It's a falling away, falling away, not falling up. How do you fall up? You fall down. It's a falling away from the true faith. And I think when Paul says that there's going to come a, a great falling away first, and I think that may happen because of a possible counterfeit rapture scenario that may be orchestrated either by government sources. I mean, you have people like Stephen Greer out there in the Disclosure Project recognizing that pretty much everything we're saying are UFOs could easily be and probably are human-made government, you know, black budget project, you know, things designed for a great deception. And you have the Project Blue Beam. How many of you guys are familiar with Project Blue Beam? Right, the whole idea of the chemtrails and whatever, they're spraying into the sky, and they can basically use the sky as a big you know, rear projection screen that the satellites up there, and yes, I do believe there are things up there, uh, can beam onto those things projections of your God. You know, you know, the Hindus might have their God. We might have Jesus up there, uh, Muhammad. You know, this, look at Catholicism supposedly started with this sign, in this sign, conquer, right? right? Constantine supposedly saw a sign in the sky, and then look what happened. So... Wow, I mean, what, how tempting is that for the enemy to do something exactly like that? I do believe that Project Blue Beam is going to probably happen. That's going to be part of a great deception. Whether it's aliens in the sense of fallen angels and demons or fallen angels and demons and humans or just humans, something may take place where technology causes people to disappear or they abduct people somehow. I don't know. But if you're that good, you know, Christian, Baptist, Darby, dispensationalist, and all of a sudden your pagan friends disappear and you stayed, you know, you're going to be like, he got raptured, really? <laughs> like, you're going to be, your faith is going to take a hit, you know, in my opinion. So, yeah, I, I believe that whatever's coming is going to be part of a massive deception that, in my opinion, those who believe in the preacher of rapture are going to be really susceptible to possibly falling into an apostasy after that because and the reason i say that is because there have been numerous failed uh, uh predictions of rapture that various cults and religious groups have had for centuries i mean you could go back to all you know 1666 the year 1666 this has got to be it right 1666 you know probably the year 666 a.d you know even december 21st 2012 i mean there and then uh, harold camping and all the predictions that remember the billboards on this day, 2011, the Bible guarantees it. Remember those billboards? I, the Bible guarantees it. We're getting out of here. Day came and went. Oh, let me revise my number. Oh, it's next month. Bible guarantees it. Nope. Then he crickets after that. Uh, but a lot of people, 
you know, they get into this mode where this is it, this is it, this is it. They put our hope and faith and trust in that it event, and then it doesn't happen, and then they're disillusioned afterwards. So uh, I believe we really need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in that regard. I believe also that the um, pre-trib rapture gives people a, a lassodical mindset and that they feel that they don't really need to do anything, that you know, as long as they believe in Christ and um, believe in his name, they're good. You know, they don't even have to go forth and sin no more, you know. And, yeah, and so um, I think that a lot of people... Because Christ tells us, and also Matthew chapter 6 tells us that, you know, at those days, there's going to be those that come to him. And he says, away from me, you workers of iniquity. I know you not. And unfortunately, the elect is but a small remnant, in my opinion, uh, a few. And I do pray that, God willing, all of us will be numbered and counted amongst the elect. But there's going to be some disappointment in that day. And so that's why I believe, you know, those of us that are here that in these times, now that we recognize the season, we should really get busy in serving the kingdom in a way that we go forth and are reborn in Christ in a manner that we do as, you know, the adulteress go forth, sin no more. Let that conversion be true and let your actions your example be your prayer and not what you say um, and so i think that is very important and if we do that then you know christ will protect his own and so with regard to the rapture be perpetually ready be perpetually ready if the hour is late we should already be uh, taking steps and movements to uh, protect ourselves and our families from what the scriptures declare as coming. Yeah, yeah, and yes, the days uh, will be shortened and it will be accelerated. That will also be part of the indication that we are in those times. And so be perpetually ready, do the work of the kingdom, uh, be the watchman, the watchwoman, sound the trumpet, blow the horn, and uh, you know their blood will not be upon us. We'll do all we can to to serve and to live up to the Ezekiel uh, watchman's parable. Yeah, just real quick, I'd like to say also is that we're to occupy until he comes, whenever that may be. And, you know, I'll be honest, I mean, I look around, I mean, we, we talk about the things we talk about at a conference like this, you watch the news, it does feel like tomorrow's the end. I mean, like we're we're there, you know, it seems like it. But when I also look around, because like people sometimes ask me, and I ask myself, to be honest with you, if really tomorrow's the end of the world, what the heck am I working on a TV series for, <laughs> right? Why, why am I doing what I'm doing? All I know is the calling that he gave me. And I know in no uncertain terms, it takes all night to tell you all the confirmations that I'm supposed to be doing what I'm doing. So I'm doing it. And I look over, I was like, look, Dave Filoni and John Favreau are working on The Mandalorian. So, you know, as long as the world's still doing their thing and they're making their stuff, I should be doing my thing too. Uh, and doing the calling that I have, you know, on my life. So that would be my in encouragement to all of you is, yes, be watchful, be wary, you know, prep as necessary, but be about the business, whatever it is Amen. that he's called you to do until he comes. Amen, Amen to that. So we have uh, two questions from the live chat, and we thank you all for joining us. Uh, the first question comes from Carly McGinn. She says, in each of your individual opinions, what would you say is the most misunderstood yet important biblical concept or truth within our smaller community <laughs> during this end time period? Narrow it down to one. The most, that's a hard one because there's so many of them. Uh, it, it feels like, well, I mean, I think biblical cosmology is huge, but I don't want to, ever make it sound like this is a salvation issue. That said, there are a whole lot of people that are getting saved because of it. Yeah. You know, I hear this from Christians all the time. You know, we should be talking about the gospel, and they're always ridiculing me. You should, we don't, should be talking about this stuff. That's not important. We should be, I mean, said, you want to compare fruit baskets? <laughs> Bring it on. I'm not saying that to brag or anything, but you're challenging me on that, saying that, you know, me talking about this is not important, and yet I've got thousands of letters 
coming in all the time, you know, uh, of people who are realizing there is a creator, many of them atheists, agnostics, you know, no longer. Uh, others that had fallen away from their faith maybe or didn't understand the Bible and now have a greater understanding and appreciation for it. So, you know, I, look, we're, we are supposed to be fishers of men. That's what we're told to do. And all I know is this is some really good bait. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's bringing a massive harvest in. So, you know, there have been many times, I tell you the truth, this is the truth. Many times I'm like, Father, I'm quitting, I'm getting a job at Walmart. This is, I'm done. And even talking about it again tonight, I mean, I've done so many of these conferences and I, I don't feel led to talk about something else. You know, I, I'm talking about the same thing over and over again. Some people are criticizing for it. And I said, well, yeah, but there's still people that don't know this. I'm not doing it for the people who watch my YouTube channel every day and have seen the same presentation 15 times. I'm doing it for the people who haven't seen it. And people come to conferences like there, they, your friend or family has seen it, but you haven't seen it. So, you know, I feel led to call, to call to talk about this thing because I believe, like I said earlier, that this is the playing field within which the entire Bible takes place. And if the Bible, it starts with Genesis chapter 1. And if the foundations be faulty, what hope do the righteous have? In other words, if you can't get the first chapter right, why should I read any further? You know, if I can't get the front of the book right, why should I care about what it says at the back of the book? So, yeah, for me, this is what I've been, what I feel led is an important thing to be talking about. Is it necessarily the most important thing? I don't know. All I know is I'm supposed to be talking about it. So, that's my calling. When it comes to deception, scientism and the education and indoctrination of it you know 99 percent of the world still believes we live on a ball and science has established the fact that or what they believe to be the fact that we evolved the monkeys in some way as well and so they've been able to place doubt into people's minds as to the authenticity the veracity of the word being prophetic and inspired and doing that you know going back to genesis and the timeline of the creation how the earth was here before even the sun uh, was placed within the firmament you know on the fourth day that creating that doubt it has separated especially our children and this generation from belief and in relationship with the most high god and with christ as savior messiah and because of that, they've all been swayed now to bend the knee to what will be this alien savior, this ancient alien antichrist. And so, yes, this topic is critical, absolutely important. I also believe that the idea of understanding serpent seed and that we are at enmity with those that are the progeny of the devil, that he does have a lineage here. And they are dedicated to evil, which is why evil has been perpetuated and propagated even to the times that we are in now. And to understand that those that sit on the thrones of the world today are part of this bloodline, you have to understand who the enemy is in order to understand the war and the strategy being employed against you. And to be able to protect your family and yourself, you have to understand the battle. And without that, you're lost. And it's because they've been able to hide who they are and what they are doing for so very long that they've been able to create and maintain the chaos that is ongoing even in this day and age. And so I would say those two concepts are critical uh, for uh, believers. All right, next question comes from Zach Lewis. Question Robin's in. Should we go to the north? <laughs> I don't see any prohibition that would say otherwise. I'm certainly intrigued by it. Um, and in conversation with Zen, I'm like, that's a lot more accessible than the south. Uh, and it's bizarre. When you look at the globe, if, if, if the globe was true, why is the South Pole so much more hostile an environment than the north is. I mean, plants and animals and stuff you can find in the north. Other than penguins, there's not really much of anything 
down south. I mean, it's a treacherous place. People always, yeah, why don't you just go down there and settle it, Rob? Like, have you done any research at all? Look into the Antarctic Treaty, first of all. Uh, but then look into the harsh conditions. Look into Shackleton's missions down there um, and Cook and other people who, who braved, you know, going down there uh, as pioneers. And even people who go down there, you know, in modern times will tell you it's a very hostile place. Um, uh, you know, I like my fingers and toes, frankly, and I, I kind of want to keep them. Uh, I grew up in New England and used to have a very good cold tolerance, but I've been living in Texas since 2003. It's gone. We I, we were in the speaker's room eating <laughs> lunch, and they had it like 54 degrees in there or something like It's freezing in here. That used to be like tank top and shorts weather for me. I'm like, you know what? I don't want to go. <laughs> I'll wait, you know, or watch it on video somewhere. But uh, I, I do think that the north is much more intriguing and much more accessible, and Godspeed to anybody who wants to go up there. Yeah, and if you do succeed in going up there, definitely let us know what's up. Uh, but with regard, we know that, you know, with the Antarctic Treaty that they have put into place uh, forces, you know, through the United Nations to keep people out of those areas. And certainly I do believe that, like Brooks Agnew, as Rob had talked about, he was trying to organize efforts to go up there and to hire a ship, a Russian uh, trolley, to, to make that journey. And as he began to go public with his efforts, opposition, of course, arised against him. And so I think they covertly want um, people to think that, you know, the area up there in the north is nothing but ice and seas and there's nothing to see. And those that do um, learn the truth of what's possibly up there, the Mount Mary, the whirlpool, the bottomless pit, the opening into the hollow earth entrance of the world, uh, these stories like Smoky God of giants living within, and also the cave of treasures uh, of the confinement of these supernatural forces within, that those things are intriguing, but that if you were to declare and publicly and try to uh, fund and to create an effort that you will you will encounter something that will stop you They're not going to just allow you to go there or to even fly over. They don't even allow Flights over the north which should be an indication that there's something to hide All right, thank you Rob. Thank you dad Zen. Uh, so we will take a Hallelujah. Praise to the Most High. So we'll take a five-minute break, and then we'll be back with our sister Diane Cover's presentation.